Okay. Well, everybody, if you haven't been to one of these sessions before, you'll notice that I just stopped the recording and started it again. It's a quick way to create a smaller video clip for asynchronous viewers. Pulling back the curtain, we call that, sharing our little tips and tricks. All right, so equity. The focus for this year's institute is flexibility for equitable learning and teaching. So I wanted to share some ideas related to equity when it pertains to engaging our students. One of my colleagues at San Francisco State, the article's a few years old now, but it still stands up against the test of time. Uh, Kimberly Tanner is in biology and she has shared five different categories of inclusive engagement strategies. They can range from giving students time to think and talk about course topics, again, using activities like that think pair share I mentioned earlier, building inclusive and fair class community space for all students. So discussing things like the diversity or lack of diversity of voices in your field, in your course materials, however you um, wanna frame it, having those conversations is important making sure that students know that all students' participation is encouraged and valued, and then monitoring your own and your students' behavior, starting with establishing norms and then keeping a track of things like microaggressions and other things in different environments, whether it be synchronous like Zoom, synchronous like in the classroom, or asynchronous like a discussion forum or a collaborative author document. Universal design for learning can help us make more equitable engagement strategies. We can do this by scaffolding our activities, making sure we're providing templates and rubrics and samples of what things look like. We can foster collaboration for those students who prefer to work interdependently. So having students work in small groups, summarizing discussions together, sometimes maybe assigning roles for them to part participate in a discussion from a particular perspective and making sure they understand how these activities, whatever the activity is, connects to the learning outcomes. At the same time, if we're being equitable, we have to acknowledge that some students, if they're working full time, if they're taking care of kids, may opt not to participate in an activity like a discussion forum or some, something else that may not be worth a lot of points. They may be willing to get a B in the class. Their goal might only be to pass it so they can keep moving toward their degree goal. And we just have to acknowledge that and maybe check in with students that aren't participating in certain types of activities and letting them know that their life experience will add a lot of value for the others. And maybe they can do some, if not all of the activities in a different way. We can also increase students' sense of connection and belonging through different types of activities. So two examples here. One, a Google Maps icebreaker where students can share stories that are meaningful to them that are either related to the course materials or not related to the course materials, depending on um, how you want to structure it. Um, in my class, I use a values affirmation activity called What Matters to Me where students pick from a list of 50 values, the top three that they feel they want to espouse at that point in time. And then they write a brief essay about how the class is going to help them live those three values or how those three values are gonna help them succeed in my class. It's a quick way to help them basically connect what's important to them to the course. There's also a way to make space for connections to the real world. Again, um, the Peralta online equity rubric has meaning, content meaning as one of its criteria for a reason, because the more meaning students can see in the course topics we're covering, um, the more connected they are to the work, the other students and us as instructors. So some quick ways that have been proposed that we can ask students to show connections between the course and their lives or course and the world. One is 
having students for 10 minutes a week just make a notebook of reflections that show the connections between course concepts and what's happening in their lives or what's happening in the world. Social media, if you have students all using a specific channel, Long Beach um, earlier in this series talked about using teams for back channeling. So maybe you could create a channel called connections, real life connections, and they could use that as a way to do it. Or if your class uses Twitter or some other social media, you can have them do it there. The last is a minute thesis where students take a minute, just one, to generate a quick thesis about the connections between course topics and life scenarios. So what are some equity challenges that we know exist based on the literature, based on students telling us in different formats? Some courses only require individual activities. And this puts students, again, who are from cultures that value collaborative learning um, at a disadvantage. So maybe mix it up by having some activities be done in small groups, or at least have opportunities for peer review so that students will be able to connect with others and learn with and among their peers. Some students of color may perceive less relevance and or lower teacher support in collaborative activities. And we'll talk about this more in a specific context in a second, but literature does show that there are some biases that take place in classes, regardless of online, in-person, or flexible, combining the two. Students' access to or skill with technology may affect their participation in class activities. This may be true for returning students who um, may not be as adept with technology. This may be true for students who only have access to a smartphone and have a hard time toggling between different applications when participating in a real-time class session. There are a number of different challenges that students face with respect to technology, including unreliable access to internet. We also know that some, some engagement activities put students who have other obligations at a disadvantage. So again, if you're creating a flexible course that does have asynchronous pathways, how can we make sure that those students are not uh, left out? And then how do we make sure that the remote students don't feel like they're just watching the in-person students engage like a movie, but that they are fully um, participating in the process? Some other equity strategies, avoid asking students to represent an entire group, one of the identities that they affiliate with, creating peer review and team project activities, and supporting students again, as I mentioned before, who have other obligations beyond academics. Earlier, I mentioned that different types of bias impact students' success and motivation in different types of activities. This Stanford study showed that in online discussion forums, instructors were 94% more likely to respond to students who had white male names, just based on the name. And so and when I saw that study, and I teach a class with 50 to 100 students, I said, am I doing that? So I created a Google spreadsheet that would allow me to track how many times I replied to each student. It's a little bit more work, but I let students know right away that I was creating this strategy with 50 to 100 students. I couldn't respond to everyone every week, but I would definitely respond to everybody who didn't get a reply from another student. And I would definitely make sure that every student would get an equivalent number of replies from me throughout the semester. You can also do this when you're calling on students in Zoom or in the classroom by using index cards um, as a way to control who's up next. And if students may not have the answer, that's okay because learning um, with mistakes is part of the process and they can always call on the next person in the stack, like a phone a friend in the old Who Wants to Be a Millionaire show um, to help them finish their response. Last but not least, we need to consider accessibility. And I know today and on Thursday, we're gonna be talking more about accessibility, but it's important to realize that when we have flexible courses, we're creating the possibility for simultaneous media streams. So if 
you have a student with visual impairments or learning disabilities in your class, they'll be possibly listening to audio from you, the person who's speaking, as well as anything that you might be presenting to them with a, that they'll have the screen reader read. So taking time for pauses so that they're only listening to one audio stream at a time is important and make sure they let you know if there are circumstances where they need a second for the screen reader to catch up or um, to just take a second to, to do that. Also, hearing impairments. Right now, we have a real-time capture. And so someone who's reading those captions would have a hard time also paying attention to what's taking place in the chat. So again, giving time for students with different abilities to manage the multiple environments in a linear fashion as opposed to a nonlinear fashion. And then obviously the media we use is also something that needs to be made accessible as well, just like we'll talk about on Thursday. Here's some references. And now I'm excited to be able to call upon colleagues from around the system to share what they're doing on their campuses.